here talking about the fire, the fire, the fire. When Pentecost or Shavuot had come, there came a sound from heaven, and there appeared tongues of fire resting on them, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit. Father, in Jesus' name, Lord God, corporately and individually, that you may begin what you started. It's written, you begin the good work, be faithful to complete it. We know you've started things, now we ask you to be faithful to complete what you started. That fire, continue to let it burn throughout the rest of this season, this year. In Yeshua's name, amen. So notice that it was um, not just, uh, it was on purpose that even though we had gotten to Acts 2, um, but I wanted to kick off the year with talking about the fire, the impartation of the fire. But here's what happened. Like, yeah, I'm fired up. Yeah, I got the fire. Amen, received the fire. But then what do we do with that fire? Where do we go from there? Now that we, we're all zealous, we're all excited, but we know uh, when fire is not taken care properly, it burns stuff down unnecessarily. But sometimes we understand that, as we spoke of last week, the fire can be quenched. But in other situations, fire does still have a purpose. So I want to get into that tonight. In Psalm 39, uh, David says, My heart was hot within me while I was musing. The fire burned. Then I, I spoke with my tongue. Now this is very important because what happens is in the body, we want to make sure that God gets all the glory, God gets all the praise. But what happens is sometimes there's an imbalance and it turns into a false humility where we just decide not to do anything. Well, because that's all God. He's all supposed to, he's supposed to do everything. The scripture said we are co-laborers with Jesus. We're co-laborers. I spoke. You have a part in this. So yes, they were filled with the Holy Spirit, but then as you'll see in note 1C, they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave no them utterance. See, that's why everybody misses it. It's awesome to be loud and wrong, ain't it? Utterance! Yeah, you just uttered something wrong, okay? You just uttered something very wrong. But that's the point, though. I, I'm actually glad that God allowed this signed sermon to take place. That's the point. This, oh, the Holy Spirit, he's doing this, he's doing that, he's doing that. Okay, yeah. I spoke, as David said in Psalms right now. Yeah, the, the Holy Spirit gave them utterances. By the way, which is also is a misconception sometimes when people, even though we're not talking about the gift of tongues tonight, but sometimes when, when, like, when I was in my old congregations, okay, and they were always talking about, you know, hating on the gifts of the Spirit and stuff like that. And they're like, well, you know, that's not the Holy Spirit. That's not the Holy Spirit. You know, and th th that's right. It says, if I pray in an unknown tongue, my Spirit prays. It doesn't say the Holy Spirit prays. As the Holy Spirit gave them utterance. You have a Spirit. You have participation with this. So we can be filled with the Holy Spirit, but then the Holy Spirit is waiting to use a vessel, willing vessel. Amen? God says, is not my word like a fire. That's what we talked about last week, right? So we break it down. It's consistent. So David spoke. Well, what did he speak about? The name of tonight's sermon is Express Yourself. Express Yourself. The word of the Holy Spirit burns, but it's not fully expressed until you communicate it. Part of the quenching the fire that we are talking about last week was how we know God has told us something to say. We know God has moved us to something. But if we're not doing it, okay, that doesn't mean God didn't want to do it. It doesn't mean God wasn't trying to do it. But God has chosen to work through us. So when there's not uh, the proper cooperation, then God either just uses, finds another vessel. But there is, unfortunately, a missed opportunity for God to really speak and minister and bless someone because we've decided to, to we get we get with the saints, right? Oh, I'm on fire for Jesus. Oh, I'm on fire. But then when we get into the actual war zone, the people that God wants that fire to touch and affect, then all of a sudden we're not speaking. We're not communicating. That was not the purpose of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit gave them utterance. You understand, if God wanted to, he could have just said, hey, I'm the Holy Spirit and I'm going to tell everybody what to do. That's not what happened. He said, I'll pour my spirit upon all flesh. 
Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. We understand and always acknowledge where the source comes from. We always acknowledge who is giving us the power and the ability, but we don't use that as an excuse to, to inactivate, so to speak, that opportunity. Express yourselves. The psalmist says, Psalms 119, 117, 172, my tongue shall speak of your word. So if we're talking about expressing ourselves, Dave, you might have to pull this down a little bit, please. <clears throat> Actually, what it is, it's the, the monitor. If you know if the monitor sends, just bring them all the way down. <clears throat> my tongue shall speak of your word. Now, I'm, I'm really wanting you to just take it personal tonight. Take it, per, take yours, express yourself. God is wanting, think about when God, out of all the things God created, out of all the things God was doing, he, oh yeah, he made man. But then in each individual, he gave specific parts. He gave eyes, he gave ears, he gave legs, he gave feet and toes, but then he gave a mouth. Now think about that. That wasn't um, uh, a quote unquote uh, a throwaway piece of the body. One of the most important things that we do is communicate. One of the most important things that we do is talk, or what we're supposed to do is communicate and talk. <laughs> One married guy gets it. <laughs> but we're supposed to make sure that we're always communicating, and, and this is something that God is, is, wants us to be a blueprint. The same way we're supposed to communicate, that's how passionate he is about the gospel. He always wants us to be communicating God's word. My tongue shall speak your word. He says, David says again, even though this isn't in the Psalms, but in 2 Samuel, Yahweh's spirit spoke through me. His word was on my tongue. This is the purpose of the fire. Not to contain it, not to quench it, but so that God will speak through us, use us, prophesy through us, communicate his word. Now, here's one of the reasons, which is honest, right? Well, I mean, but I don't know what to say. What if I say the wrong thing, right? Job 6, he says, teach me, I will hold my tongue and cause me to understand where I have erred. Now, there is no person in this room that has always said the right thing at the right time. That's why, that's why we're sometimes, you know, hey, I'm not, I'm not, I never said I was perfect. That's not how it works. No one always says the right thing at the right time, but you need to be willing to adjust your conversation. This is encapsulated in what I call the fear of being wrong, which actually is a pride issue. Mm -hmm. I have no problem being wrong. I'm, like, I'm always saying, what am I doing? The people that I'm close with, the question that I ask the most, what am I missing? What am I doing wrong? I want them to, let's correct it. Remember, a lot of people fall into what I call the, the sin of Cain, and we think, yeah, Cain killed his brother. But the sin of Cain began when God came to correct them. He said, yeah, okay, fine, yes, you're wrong. But if you can prove yourself, if you do better, you will be received. Cain didn't have to murder his brother, he chose to not be corrected. So sometimes we're just so afraid of saying the wrong thing, speaking the wrong, okay, that's fine. When you say the wrong thing, all right, here's how you say it right, you get over it, you move on. Does that make sense? Don't hide from your mistakes. That's what the fear of being wrong, well, what if I say the wrong thing? So then all of a sudden you're hiding from your, sometimes you need to say the wrong thing before you learn how to say the right thing. Most of the stuff that I do have right at one time was actually wrong. But I put myself out and okay, God, show me where I'm wrong. Show me what I, I have to be available and humble enough to actually put myself in a position where let God be true, every man alive. Everyone's going to make a mistake. Everyone's going to say something. But when I do that, I put myself in a position where God can say, okay, uh, Jason, here's where you did. This is where it was right. Here's where you need to tweak that. Here's where you here's where it can get better. But you have to be willing to receive that correction, not just with your heart. Well, Jesus knows my heart. But you also need to be willing to do that with your mouth. So for those struggling with the fear of being wrong, good news for you. That same Holy Spirit that baptized 2,000 Jews with fire and power, and all of a sudden they're, they're, they're prophesied and saved and hanging out and loving Jesus. That same Holy Spirit is here today. And Jesus says, I will give you a mouth and wisdom which none of your enemies will be able to resist or contradict. I will give you a mouth. Think about that. I will give you a mouth and a wisdom. Listen. We are aware 
that the tongue has said some horrible things. We are aware that the tongue has done more damage than, than guns. There's literally, there's some time, there's some, there's some things that people said to me that I would prefer that they picked up a gun and shot me than what they just said. But God wants you to get over the fear, quote unquote, saying the wrong thing. He says, I will give you a mouth of wisdom which none of your enemies will be able to resist or contradict. Because the Holy Spirit is always right. And this is more uniquely addressed to this passage in 926. Whoever will be ashamed of me, hold on, and my words. This is why I'm always consistent with saying it's not about just believing in Jesus, it's also believing what Jesus believed. So, oh yeah, I love Jesus, whatever. Well, Jesus says that uh, you're supposed to uh, get married before you move in together. And blah, blah, blah. Oh, well, I mean, well, but uh, Jesus says that uh, that whole uh, homosexuality thing, yeah, that's not. Well, I mean, well, maybe whatever. Uh, and all of a sudden, we're taking all the things that Jesus actually was talking about, and maybe, well, it's, he didn't just say, are you ashamed of me? But he said, ashamed of me and my words. Of him shall the Son of Man be ashamed. Hold on. Then he just brings out this, like, this line. Now, when people introduce, like, hey, I just want you to know, when and I will have lunch, whatever. Yeah. I'm going to see you Saturday, Wendell. And when I come Saturday, I'm coming in the glory of the Father and of the holy angels. Like, wait, what, wait, what? Just so that you're clear on what Jesus was talking about, the importance of being ashamed of him and his word, and then he backed it up and said this, uh, of him will the Son of Man be ashamed when he returns in his own glory, in his Father's glory, and in the glory of the holy angels. That's the weight that he's putting on him and his words. So we're taking this, this, this thing to a whole different level when we're talking about not just believing in Jesus, but also believing what Jesus believed. Because the true battle in the congregations is what I call the uh, Titus 1.16 uh, uh, anomaly. They profess to know him, but in works they deny him. Make sure that we're not just, that we're not, we want to be, we don't want to be ashamed of the, of the gospel. We want to be ashamed of, but I'm really discouraged that many people are backing away from just what Jesus said, from the scriptures itself. If impressing people is more important than impressing Yahweh, then you're focusing on the wrong audience. And that's what happens when people are ashamed of not just Jesus, but ashamed of what he said. Because you're more concerned about men and you're focusing on the wrong audience. Keep your attention on the one who will be judging. Keep your attention on the one who matters. That will slow up that whole being embarrassed for standing for Jesus and his word. In Acts 2, it says that there were dwelling at Jerusalem Jews out of every nation under heaven. And they're all amazed and saying, how do we hear every man in our own native tongue? But it's very interesting to me. <laughs> this is why, and we're not talking about this tonight, okay? So I don't want people to, to get too derailed. But this is why it's such an enigma to me that the communities, the congregations, the church and the synagogues are where they're at in complete uh, opposition to what, Acts, what was going on in Acts 2. It wasn't just a bunch of Jews, but they made it clear. Jews from every nation. Like, there's no excuse to miss this. Jews from every nation. Peter preaches. And they all say, well, you know, we don't believe in Jesus. No. Uh, they heard this. They're cut to the heart. What do, we, what do we need to do? Jews from every nation. That is not the way the gospel has been presented now in Gentile contemporary 
first century Christianity. First, first century Christianity is completely different than current contemporary uh, Christianity. Because Acts 2 is, is a, it's, it's just, I read this passage and I'm like, wow, you want to talk about backwards. Paul says in Philippians 2, at the name of Jesus or at Yeshua's name, every knee will bow. Jews from every nation, every knee will bow, every tongue will confess to the glory of God the Father that Yeshua the Messiah is Lord. Notice, express yourself. It's, it's when, they, when, the, when the fire came, they spoke with their tongues. It's my tongue will speak your word. And now God doesn't just say, listen, I want everyone to bow to me. But he's also saying every tongue will confess because your action and your word are supposed to be synonymous. There shouldn't be this uh, inconsistency between what you do and what you say. And the act of bowing, the act of confessing. But he makes it clear in Philippians 2. This is, by the way, this is one of those, uh, you better not uh, forget this verse, by the way. You better not forget this verse. Why? Because this verse is directly quoted from Isaiah 45. Now, the reason why you want to hold this verse and lock it in, say lock it in. You got some people, well, you know, Jesus is not God. Paul never said Jesus is God. There's no divine aspect. Paul is quoting this verse. Listen, every Jew knew this verse in Isaiah 45. I am God, there is no one else. I have sworn by myself. That to me, every knee shall bow, every tongue confess. Yahweh's been quoting this for hundreds of years. This verse has been clear. We know that to Yahweh God, every knee will bow, every tongue will confess. So Paul knew exactly what he was doing in Philippians 2 when he says, yeah, at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow and every tongue will confess. This should be just automatic default. So he says in Matthew 10, whoever confesses me before men, whoever confesses me, Jesus says whoever confesses me, I will also confess before my Father. Whoever denies me before men, I will also deny before my Father. And the reason why I was being consistent with Philippians 1, remember, they profess they know him, but in works, they deny him. Because confession in your actions are not, we are not preaching a, a, a Gentile Hellenistic perspective on the Bible. We don't separate what you do and what you say. What you say and what you do are consistent. So confessing and bowing, your action and your word, congruent. Whoever confesses me before men, I will also confess before my Father. Whoever denies me before men, I will also deny before my Father. Yahweh created every tongue to confess to every man that his son, Yeshua, is Lord. You think about God's creating the eyes, God's creating the feet, God's creating, and he's like, yeah, that tongue, there's a reason that tongue is created to confess to Jesus. My son is Lord. So in these last slides, I kind of want to get to the whole intimidation thing that people still have. And, and sometimes when it comes to speaking or you feel like you don't know what to say, but the, but the Holy Spirit, I'm telling you, the Holy Spirit will give you words to say. God will give you, he'll give you a mouth to conquer every uh, intimidating stare from the enemy. That, that When you really grab a hold of that, your witness will be not just more effective, but more importantly, It'll do what God designed it to do. God designed your mouth to literally change nations. Your prophetic tongue, that tongue is not in your mouth in vain. Your words are not in vain. Why do you think when Jesus takes words seriously, like in, in Matthew 12, he says, every idle word men shall speak, you will give an account thereof. By your words, you'll be justified, and by your words, you'll be condemned. And I don't really need to <laughs> listen. I'm pretty sure that if someone went through all my vernacular, that some of the saints would have a problem with some of the slander terms I use for But there are certain what I call clearly distinguishable curse words, okay? And I'm very concerned at certain languages that are coming out from people's mouths. It's a tongue, but it's not a holy one. Jesus says, 
every idle, well, you know, God knows my heart. I didn't need to say it. Every idle word men shall speak, they will give an account for them. For by your words, you will be justified. By your words, you will be condemned. Do we really take our tongue seriously? We're accountable for what we do. Hey, man, but we're also accountable for what we say. The most important thing is who we confess as our Lord. Amen? Amen. So with this tongue, you may have heard of him, uh, uh, but, uh, Moses. Yeah, Moses. He did a few things in the Bible. He's kind of famous. Well, you know, it's hard for me to speak in front of people, and I don't have the right words. I'm not that uh, fluent in my vocabulary, whatever. No, praise God. He was Moses. Matter of fact, now here's what I always try to juxtaposition myself with. You know, when I look at, like, I, I was in a situation, I'd be like, well, obviously it's you, so whatever you say, I'm going to do, right? Like some people, well, I've never seen God face to face, so how do I know God really called me, or how do I know God really wants me to do this? Whatever. Literally, <laughs> flame in a bush. Hey, Moses, it's me. And after all that, yeah, God, I'm not sure that you, I'm, I, yeah. Wow. Now, certain uh, passages, we're going to look at the English. So when God called him to speak to the people, and so Moses says, Yahweh, I have never been a man of words. Um, some translations, I'm not eloquent. But I am slow of speech and of tongue. And I just really wanted to break something down in Hebrew because it actually cracked me up this week. So he gets to the part, uh, you know, lo each devarim, not a man of words. But when he says, when he says, I'm not eloquent, eloquent, some English translations will say that. Or other translations may say, you know, I've never, I, you know, I've never been a man of words. But he literally was like, gam mitmol, gam mishil shom, gam me'az. He says, from back in the day, not from, even from the time when you spoke to me, he was covering every basis of time. God, I have never been able to speak well. Even, and then he says, even from, some, from the time that you just spoke to me, he literally covering every there is nothing left in the Hebrew to give any room that Moses does not think that he can speak good <laughs> I know it's talk well but anyway so so this is this is what I want to what, what I want to break down here Yahweh says to him who has made man's mouth have an eye so now so now go, and I will be with your mouth and teach you what to say. Even though express yourself with the main title, but the subtitle is the Lord of Now. Yeah, I've never been this. I've never been a strong pro. I've never been brave. I've never been uh, uh, faithful. I've never been consistent. I've never been a good talker. I've never been a witness. I've never prayed. I've never been. Okay, fine, fine. Up until now. He says, yeah, you haven't been able to do this. You haven't been good at evangelizing. You haven't been good at praying. You haven't been good at witness. Fine, fine, fine. But now God is calling you now. Amen. Yeah, yeah, I hear all that, Moses. Yeah, yeah, but I make me right. So now go. I'll be with your mouth and teach you what to say. Sounds just like Jesus saying, for I will give you your mouth in that hour. I'll just give you your mouth the words to say. God is always ready to use your mouth. Stop letting the lies of I have never sew up what Yahweh is trying to do now. God does not care about your nevers. Do not be discouraged with past failures. Be not discouraged with thought. You know, maybe Moses was going back to elementary school when he had to give a book report and he stumbled all over the place and kids made fun of him. I don't know what experiences that were just so devastating and that was just paralyzing Moses with fear when it came to speak. But now the creator of the universe, the one who has made his mouth, is saying, hey, that thing that you have the least confidence in, I want to use. The thing you are most 
insecure about. That's what I want to use. So God's angry at Moses and said, is not Aaron your brother? Yeah, is not Aaron your brother? I know that he can speak well. You'll speak to him and put words in his mouth and I'll be with your mouth and his mouth and we'll teach you what to say. Hmm. Hmm. Wow. Isn't that great, right? And there's some of you sigh with relief. See, I don't have to do it because God will give me an Aaron. I do have a prophetic word for you tonight. I'm not kidding. If Jesus says, in that hour, the Holy Spirit will teach you what to say. In that hour, the Holy Spirit. Okay, this is after Moses. This is after Moses, right? So during the time, Moses, I need an Aaron. I need someone because, you know, I can't talk, right? Okay, fine, I'll get Aaron. And I'm going to teach Aaron what to say. And then I'll teach you what to say. I'll put your words in your mouth and you put it in his mouth, whatever. Which just seems overly, unnecessarily complicated. But now Jesus comes along and says, in that hour, the Holy Spirit will teach you what to say. Well, what's the prophetic word, Jason? The Holy Spirit is now erasing errands. Yeah. Some of you have been personally like, that, the people I normally call or talk to or try to use whatever, when I didn't put in prepared, whatever, blah, 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 they're, they're not as accessible anymore as things are kind of evaporating out of my life. Yeah, because the Holy Spirit is called you. Jesus is saying, I will pray to the Father and he'll give you Aaron. So that Aaron can, no, I'm giving you the Holy Spirit so that you will speak. So this has never been a ministry where all the confidence and all the assurance has been on the man preaching. It's always been about equipping you, encouraging you to go out and do what God has already anointed you to do. I'm just the cheerleader. Go get them. Go bring them in. Go speak. Well, Jason, you know, I'm not, I don't know all the scriptures you know. The Holy Spirit will give you that hour of work. What, what's going on? Go get them. So all the people that you, you know, well, maybe I just Google this and, the, and, God, and, and God, Father, one day God is just going to crash Google and then everyone's going to be screwed. Because at the end of the day, it's like, well, I got what are you going to do if all of a sudden you can't look up because you haven't learned God for yourself? You haven't learned the word for yourself. You have, and all of a sudden you don't have these errands in your life. The Holy Spirit is here to teach you so that you release his word. So be not afraid of saying the wrong thing when you're submitting yourself to the spirit of God. You know what? That some of the worst experiences of witnessing have proved some of the greatest fruit in my life. Like, there's people that are like, oh, God, I just completely blew it. And I just, uh, uh, I didn't even, I was trying, God, I just made myself feel okay, whatever, blah, blah. And so those are some of the greatest stories of, of fruit in my life. Because God will still be obedient to his word if you're obedient to let him use his word for you. And the things that you are thinking about they don't even remember. Oh, I said that. I shouldn't have said that, whatever. They but they're thinking about the one thing. I, sometimes I call it spill or receive, but sometimes I call it the accurate procession into your heart. There's sometimes there's just one thing that you said in the midst of 27 things that maybe weren't the best things or the most eloquent way, but sometimes you don't know what that person needs to hear. You just open your mouth and speak. You trust God and let the Spirit impart the seed and do the work. Because anything else is having confidence in your speech, in your wisdom, and in your communication. So what are we sowing? Again, we didn't detach it from God's word. You know the words you are. You know the scripture you are supposed to say. You're trying to reinvent the will. You're trying to reinterpret. Well, maybe God kind of meant it this way. Just say it the way God said it. He means it when he says don't add or take away from his word. You don't need to be creative. He's already created the best blueprint of witnessing the, the, the manual in the Bible. Just in case someone is thinking that I'm saying, oh, just say whatever. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about spirit-filled people who know the word, who know what they're supposed to say, but aren't being yielding enough to the Holy Spirit to communicate what they're supposed to say because they're afraid of how they're going to react. You're afraid of how someone's going to respond. Oh, 
one of my favorite psalms. I am Yahweh your God who brought you from Egypt. Open your mouth wide and I will fill it. It's his job to fill you with the Holy Spirit. It's his job to give you the words to say. It's just your job to be obedient, to open it. And lose your tongue. So they weren't just excited. Oh, we got the fire. Oh, all of a sudden, we, we, we feel God's presence. We feel God's presence. And they begin to declare the wonderful works of God. See, sometimes people make it too uh, complicated. Listen, instead of trying to figure out what you don't know or trying to figure out what you don't know, but there are certain things that you clearly, clearly no, God has told you to say. There's some things that are clearly set up in this word. Just stick with that. Open up your mouth and declare how good he is. Open up your mouth and declare how he's done, what he's done for you. That's what your testimony is. If there's a word of correction, if there's a word of rebuke, okay, well, just let God speak that too. But at the end of the day, you're here to communicate God's truth, God's word. That's why God gave you your tongue. And every morning or evening when you're brushing your teeth, and sometimes, because some people don't brush their tongue. I don't understand that. I brush my tongue. I'm sorry. Food is all in your mouth, and if you think food never hits your tongue. So when I'm brushing my tongue, <laughs> I'm realizing this. It, it's a, think about the only time you think about your tongue is when you bite it accidentally, which I just keep doing, which is just irritating. Or when you're brushing your tongue like me. And but okay, but it's a weird looking thing and, and like even trying to get pictures like sometimes they actually have a picture of the tongue and attached from the mouth I'm like that, like wow but it was one of the most necessary instruments that God chose to use to declare his truth your tongue so when Acts 2 are filled with the spirit they're speaking to the Jews and proselytes we hear them speak in our tongues the wonderful works of God. You don't have to go out outside the box. You don't have to try and just be um, overly spiritual. Just be faithful to what you do know is true. He says, to him that has, I'll give more. To him that uses what he's given you, he'll add to the rest. He'll, he's faithful to do that. But you've got to be faithful in the small before you're faithful in much. And you're, sometimes people are watching these other preachers and are like, well, I can't preach like that. I can't talk like that. Like, what are you doing comparing yourself to someone else? Say what God told you to say. Be faithful in the small. And if, there, if there's only one thing that you've learned from me, hopefully you've learned that I don't care how small it is, it's never insignificant. I will just be faithful with whatever I got. So in conclusion, they're talking about the wonderful works of God. When you are conflicted about saying something that you know you're supposed to say, when you're challenged with the opportunity and you decide, what, what, there's something that's blocking that flow of the Spirit. There's a, there's a pathway in your, in your mind that's just challenging what, what, what God really wants to say and do. So then just ask yourself the question, why am I saying this? What am I really doing this for? Speak for divine results, not carnal reactions. There's some things, some things you're gonna say is gonna tick people off, doesn't matter. There's some things you're gonna say if people are standing and cheer, those are still carnal reactions. It's not about reactions, it's about results. Because Jesus talks about the people that hear the word at first and they're all happy and excited, whatever, and then they fall away. So you got the reaction you wanted, but the result did not end with commitment and faith. The reason why we speak the word, because it's the word that brings life, the word that brings power. And even if you don't get the immediate reaction you want, the end result will not return void. The end result, not the immediate reaction, 
There's plenty of people that five, six, ten years later, people came back to me, remember Jason when you said, and I was mad, or whatever. Yeah, I said it because I knew you'd be mad, but I wasn't preaching for your reaction because so that you'd be my best friend. I wanted that result that would bring fruit to repentance and eternal life. That's the difference. So be not discouraged. Everyone is not applauding you or cheering you or giving you money when you're preaching the truth. But you better not be speaking for common reactions. But for not divine results. Stand up on your feet, please. God will say what he wants to say. God will do what he wants to do. If you got nothing out of tonight's message, it's simply that God wants to use your mouth and your tongue to say what he wants to say. Amen. Who's here has wrestled with intimidation of speaking the truth, speaking God's word? Yeah, okay, that's fair. That's fair. Now, I have to admit, there, that's usually the norm. Several people raise their hand. And there was a time when I was detached from it. Like, I didn't understand it. What do you... What's there to be ashamed of? What's there to be embarrassed about? But as I started studying, I realized that the demonic assignment of why the enemy would position that intimidation in your life because the enemy actually believes in the word that you're supposed to speak more than you do. The enemy actually believes that if that thing is released from your mouth, it's going to start doing damage to the kingdom of darkness. So you better believe he's going to put assignments around you to keep you from saying what God wants you to say. There is no sacrifice that I will not make for the eternal fruit of someone's soul when it comes to the kingdom of God. So regardless of the intimidation, you push through it. Regardless of the fear, the anxiety, you push through it because God has a divine utterance for your mouth for someone else. Make sure that you're not standing for the king of glory and he's asking you one question. Here's what, listen, I want to hear him say, well done, a good, good and faithful servant, but I don't want to hear him say, why didn't you say? Yeah, you love me, but there's people that miss an opportunity because I put the word in your mouth. Bless these people that I follow. Grab a hold of our hearts, Father. I rebuke condemnation, but let the conviction fall where it may. No more missed opportunities in Jesus' name. If you believe that, lift up your hand to the Lord and just, Father, in Jesus' name, no more missed opportunity. We will say what we're supposed to say, how we're supposed to say, because we will get the divine, the divine results. If there's anyone specifically, I just want to be led tonight. There's anyone specifically, not just where, yeah, I can feel the, 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 the intimidation of the enemy, yeah, whatever, sometimes I have to press through whatever. Is there someone that is specifically a fear and it terrorizes you and has kept you from speaking the word of God because of fear and it's literally terrorized you from speaking the word of God? Is there anyone dealing with that where it's almost paralyzing to say what God wants you to say? Because I don't want, the devil is a liar. Now, there's two things, though, with that. So the good news is, you're all, when the Son is set free, is free indeed. The, 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 the rebuke is that you're re accountable and responsible. So that means it's a disobedience issue if you're not speaking what God told you to speak. It's not a demonic assignment. It's not a demonic attack. It's just you're not being obedient to say what God wants you to say. Don't be condemned. Just be corrected. This year, we're glad of souls.